America is busy now. Factories hum and millions of men, formerly idle, now work night and day on tanks, airplanes, defense orders. But what about tomorrow? Tomorrow when the defense emergency is over, can we keep these men employed making goods people need for living? New labor-saving machines will be invented. Must they again throw men out of work or can we use the new machines to make more goods, more jobs? I just heard a rumor there's going to be a layoff. Think there's anything in it? We've heard that kind of talk before. Don't pay any attention to it. We've been here for four years now. We ought to be good for another four years at least. I sure hope so. much concerned over laying the men off as you are, Barnes. But I don't see how we can avoid it. I hate to break the news. Some of these men have been with us for 10 years and more. It's going to be awfully hard on them and their families. But this decision wasn't reached overnight. The board's been discussing it for months. We have finally decided to put in the new labor-saving machinery. Costs will be lower and production greater. That will be good news for the stockholders if it works. But there still remains the question of the men. By the way, how many men are there in Department 5? 64. 64? Well, I'm sorry to give you these instructions, Barnes, but the machinery will be ordered. It will be delivered next week. And that means? The men in number 5 will have to go. I'm sorry. Just so, Tom. High speed machinery goes in. But men like you and me go out. Yes, machines come in and men go out. Everywhere the same story. These whirring wheels spinning faster, ever faster. A mighty crescendo of production. They typify a constantly changing industry. An industry that ever seeks to do its appointed work cheaper and quicker and better. Thank you. 
sent for me, Mr. Farmer? Oh, yes, Colby. I'm glad you came. That will be all, Miss Warren. Something I want to show you. Look at those goods piled up over there. You know, I'm worried. Let's go back to the office and talk this thing over. Uh, we've got to do something. I'm worried. Here we are. We've got the new machines, and they're doing even better than we expected. They've not only cut production costs, but they've increased output over 50%. But we're not selling this additional product. Inventories are piling up. Now, what are we going to do about it? It seems to me we've got to change our plan completely. The trouble is we've always catered to a fairly small class of customers at a good price. Sales have come pretty steadily and fairly easily. Now that we're increasing production, we've got to put on more pressure, work the territory more intensively. You mean, uh, more advertising? An increased sales force? Additional dealers? Yes. Start an aggressive selling campaign right away. Tell the people more about the advantages of our product. Use billboards, magazines, radio. Sell the dealers on the plan in advance and have them well stocked. That will relieve our inventories and get the goods into the hands of the consumer. Well, I'm not sure the plan will work, but it's worth trying. I'll take it up with the executive committee tomorrow. Meanwhile, suppose you work out a rough estimate of the cost of the campaign and let me have it tomorrow. I'll do that. Have a busy day, dear? So, so. Have any luck today, Tom? Same old story all over again. No jobs, no luck. Well, never mind, honey. You'll get a break soon. Alice, there's something I want to talk to you about. Tramp the streets of this city till I know every building by heart. There just aren't any jobs to be had. It's the same story everywhere. New machines, high-speed production, fewer jobs, and 10 men for every job that can be had. You're just tired, dear. Please let me finish, Alice. About a week ago, I wrote to Cousin Martin. I told him what we were up against. So I asked him if he could possibly find a place for us on his farm. Well, I got an answer today. He wants us to come out and live with him. He says I can be of some help to him, and he's sure that Jane could find a lot of work for you to do. We can go right away. But the campaign advocated by the sales manager fails. The great middle class he sought to reach cannot buy at prevailing prices. People stop at windows, look, and pass by. Yes, the campaign failed. It failed in the city and in the country, too. Let's look in at a typical country store. Anything wrong with the bill, Martin? No, no, it's just, just a bit higher than I thought, that's all. There, I guess, I guess that'll take care of it all right. That's right. Thank you. Martin, how about taking home that gas engine? You want it, don't you? <laughs> sure. Sure, there's a lot of things around here we could use, but price is still too high. And that's one of the things I guess we'll have to do without for a little while longer. Well, it'll be here when you're ready. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye.
comes right to this, gentlemen. We have made a large investment in labor-saving machinery. It is giving us a bigger output at a large saving in labor costs. The sales campaign was well enough done, I'm sure of that. Our advertisements are appearing everywhere, and our sales force is on the job. But the fact is, we are not selling the additional output the new machines are giving us. Our inventories are mounting, and that cannot continue long if we are to remain solvent. The truth is, I guess, that the people just can't afford to buy. They can't afford to pay our price. There's only one thing to do now, as I see it, and that is to reduce our price. This would, I believe, give us a larger market and bring us many new customers who can use our product, but who cannot afford to buy it now. That doesn't always work. I'm also a director in a food company. and I know very well that a lower price doesn't always sell more food. You reduce your price anyway, Bill. A lower price on some things helps the people to buy other things, and that helps the rest of us. Maybe, but it doesn't help our food company. Well, now let's see. Even if the price reduction plan did work, it would reduce our profits drastically and make it more difficult to pay a fair dividend, wouldn't it? Not necessarily. A profit on each article would be less, of course. But if we succeed in expanding our market sufficiently, we might sell so many more articles, the total profit would not suffer. In fact, if the plan worked out real well, we might even have to buy more machines and re-employ the men who were laid off because of new equipment. Total profits might then be greater. I'm afraid of it. Price reduction is dangerous. You can reduce prices easily enough, but you can't get them back again to the old level if you have to. At the same time, I do think the key to the problem is to expand our market. In my opinion, though, that will only happen when we get a little more prosperity and wages go up all over the country. Then most everybody could afford to buy our products. Why not start the ball rolling by raising wages in our own plant right now? Why bring that up again? It wouldn't be a drop in the bucket. Besides, we'd probably go broke. Whatever we do, I, for one, am convinced that we've got to expand our market by getting more people to buy our product. Yes, I know. Well, well I know. Our well, I know. Our These men are the strategists of business. Throughout this broad land, they seek constantly to solve this puzzle, to untangle the web of prices and buying, of costs and income, of machines and of men. How shall these conflicting factors be arranged to provide better living, more enjoyment of the good things of life, and abundance for all? problem at the crossroads. Broad highways leading in all directions. Which way shall we take?